please. Thank you for this kind of invitation. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, it is a great honor for me to speak uh, among such distingu distinguished scholars. Uh, and uh, I hope that my talk will be at least uh, a little bit interesting, uh, especially considering, uh, considering its topic, uh, which seems to be quite uh, lightweight compared to uh, the previous ones. Uh, could you speak a little louder, perhaps? Uh, okay. Uh, in, uh, so the topic of uh, uh, my talk is moral emotions from a uh, new philosophical perspective. And uh, here's a brief outline of the talk. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, make a couple of general remarks about uh, neuro philosophy its subject matter and its relations uh, with uh, philosophy in science. Uh, then I'd like to speak about uh, uh, the problem of horizontal and vertical explanation of cognitive phenomena, which will be uh, important in the later parts of the, uh, of the talk. Then I'll present uh, two theories of emotion, uh, very well-known theories, uh, first of all, First of them is cognitive, uh, the second of them is non-cognitive, and uh, the last uh, part of the talk will be uh, about the question, is emotion uh, a natural kind? Uh, so, uh, uh, at the beginning, what is uh, neurophilosophy? Uh, well, traditionally, neuro neurophilosophy is con contrasted with uh, philosophy of neuroscience, uh, philosophy of neuroscience addresses the uh, foundation, foundational issues in neuroscience. For example, the issue of scientific explanation in neuroscience, um, how it looks like or how it should uh, look uh, like. So this is uh, not very different from the traditional uh, philosophies of science concerning different sciences from neuroscience. And uh, neurophilosophy is uh, well, something different. Uh, the uh, traditional definition says that uh, neurophilosophy consists in application of neuroscientific concepts to philosophical problems. The example of such problems are uh, free will, <coughs> uh, responsibility, the mind-body problem, or the nature of emotions. But uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, the, the subject matter of neurophilosophy corresponds uh, to a great extent uh, to uh, the subject matter of uh, philosophy in science. Uh, for example, we can speak that there are uh, certain philosophical problems which are intertwined with uh, neuroscientific problems, like uh, the problem of consciousness. We can also uh, uh, mention uh, certain philosophical assumptions uh, which are present in neuroscience. For example, the assumptions about uh, the reduction of the mind to the brain, speaking very uh, broadly. Uh, and uh, also we can point to the fact that uh, mm, there were cases where uh, mm, philosophical uh, assumptions uh, were uh, reasons or causes of certain neuroscien neuroscientific theories. A very interesting uh, example of this last uh, subject matter of neurophilosophy is, uh, uh, is a book uh, by Karl Popper and uh, John Eccles. It is a, a book from uh, 1970s, if I remember correctly. And, uh, and uh, this is basically the first uh, major publication in uh, neurophilosophy. Uh, so it's, it's before uh, the famous book of Patricia Churchland, which was uh, entitled Neurophilosophy. And in the book uh, by Popper and Eccles, uh, and Eccles uh, we have a, a, a certain uh, philosophical uh, assumptions uh, uh, which are pointed by Karl Popper and Eccles. They believe that uh, it is impossible 
uh, to defend uh, the existence of such uh, abilities like free will uh, if uh, one mm, uh, doesn't assume uh, dual dualism in the philosophy of mind. So uh, the uh, position that mind is something different from the body and uh, Eccles uh, uh, is uh, in, uh, basing his uh, neuroscientific theory on that assumption. Basically his uh, theory of uh, psychons, his theory of consciousness is based on this philosophical assumption that uh, mind is something different, distinct from the body. Uh, so, uh, to conclude this, this short introduction, uh, neurophilosophy, uh, the subject matter of neuro neurophilosophy is uh, quite similar, it corresponds to the subject matter of uh, philosophy in science, and um, uh, excuse me. And now uh, to the second uh, part of the talk. Uh, different levels of explanation of cognitive phenomena. Uh, when one tries to uh, explain the mind or, or the behavior, uh, it usually uh, is assumed that this explanation uh, cannot be uh, made only um, on one level of explanation. One has to combine different levels of explanation. Uh, an obvious uh, candidate of such levels would be neuroscientific level, psychological level, uh, and uh, philosophical level. And today I would like to, uh, to focus on two levels, the folk uh, psychological level, uh, explanation, level of explanation, which employs such concepts as uh, belief, desire, or emotion, and this uh, uh, kind of explanation uh, is uh, uh, characteristic for explanation in philosophy, but also in psychology. Uh, some say that, for example, in game theory, we also have uh, explanation with uh, the uh, with uh, which utilizes the concept of belief and desire. Uh, and uh, the second level is neuroscientific level. Uh, which indicates how neural mechanisms operate to produce behavior or to realize more specific cognitive functions. And uh, uh, it is often uh, argued that any account of explanation of cognitive phenomena should combine different level of explanation. It must utilize not only the components of explanation present at each of the different levels, so the psychological level, neuroscientific level, the uh, philosophical level, but it uh, must also utilize uh, certain components allowing to bind the different levels of explanation. Just uh, different level of explanation we can use when uh, trying to explain the mind or behavior. And uh, first we have a horizontal level of explanation. And uh, these horizontal uh, levels of explanation are characteristic for those uh, distinct uh, explanations like uh, psychological level explanation or neuroscientific level. Uh, the first characteristic of this level of explanation is that it refers to distinct events or states which are at least usually temporally at antecedent from the events which are being explained. And then uh, the second uh, characteristic is uh, that this explanation proposes a relation between those events. Uh, and the uh, paradigmatic case of such an explanation is causal explanation. And then uh, uh, the second kind of explanation is the, the vertical level of explanation. Uh, and it is an explanation why the uh, relations between the events at the horizontal level hold. So uh, the uh, horizontal level of explanation combines uh, the different, uh, uh, the vertical level of explanation combines the different horizontal level of explanation into a coherent whole. And uh, uh, 
often when a vertical explanation is proposed, it consists in explaining the relations at the higher level of explanation by reference to the relations at the lower level of explanation. So, uh, a simple example. For example, if we want to uh, explain why uh, uh, a certain neuron fired, uh, we can uh, explain it on the horizontal level by mentioning that some other neurons fired and that caused uh, this particular neuron to fire. But also, uh, but in some situations, this explanation is not uh, enough, and we would like to know why uh, the, uh, those neurons caused our neuron to fire, and then we can uh, move uh, a level down, and for example, mention some events happening at the synaptic junctions between the neurons, uh, to the activity of neurotransmitters, and that's the, the general idea of uh, vertical and horizontal level of explanation. This is, of course, only a, a very general sketch. Uh, and here is uh, a uh, quite elaborated example of combining those, dif those uh, dif different levels of explanation. It is David Mars theory of visual processing. And uh, uh, Mars, uh, Mar is uh, this theory is very uh, influential, uh, not only among uh, philosophers or psychologists, but also neuroscientists, because it is, uh, at least in my opinion, the most elaborate uh, account uh, to explain a cognitive phenomena in terms of, uh, well, neuroscience, basically. And uh, uh, Mar distinguishes between three uh, horizontal uh, uh, levels of explanation. We have computational level, algorithmic level, and implementational level. Uh, the computational level, computational level is the most, most general one. Uh, at uh, this level, uh, we have to mention uh, what is the function of uh, our cognitive ability, uh, the cognitive ability we are trying to explain, and uh, why uh, does the system perform this cognitive ability? If we have uh, answers to uh, these questions, we can move a level down to the algorith algorithmic level, and we can ask um, uh, what task, tasks need to be done in order to realize those functions. Uh, and uh, uh, the, lowest level, the, the lowest level is implementational level, here we uh, try to indicate uh, a specific uh, part in the brain which realizes uh, our cognitive ability. And uh, here uh, the uh, horizontal levels are uh, intertwined with uh, <coughs> vertical level and it's, uh, well, it it's, uh, gives us such a uh, hierarchical, hierarchical account of visual processing. So this is basically what I just said. Yeah, but, uh, mm, there are uh, certain problems with uh, explaining uh, more uh, the higher cognitive function functions because uh, uh, Mars account uh, deals only with early early visual processing. Uh, which, is, which is the visual processing from the moment of receiving the initial information about external environment to the moment of constructing a three-dimensional object from the input information. So uh, it deals with only a very, uh, we would say, small, narrow uh, cognitive ability. Uh, and uh, uh, such abilities like visual recognition of the perceived object the remembering of the perceived objects and many other cognitive abilities related to vision are left out from the scope of the explanation. Uh, this is, uh, this uh, remark is crucial because explanation of low level specialized cognitive abilities do not seem to involve uh, folk psychological notions. So it seems that there is no problem with uh, uh, neuroscientific 
um, uh, explanation of such small, simple uh, cognitive abilities. Why is that? Because uh, they are, uh, uh, at, at least in traditional cognitive science, uh, defined as cognitive mo mo modules. And uh, one has to admit that those simple cognitive abilities, uh, uh, well, uh, it is justified to say that they really possess these uh, characteristics. And uh, here are some of them, the most uh, important ones, I guess. Uh, first of, uh, first one uh, says that uh, cognitive modules are distinct faculties of the mind. They produce quick solutions in highly determined circumstances. Uh, then, uh, mandatory application. Modules respond automatically to stimuli of the appropriate kind rather than being under any executive control. Uh, informational encapsulation. Uh, modules are unaffected by the activity of other parts of the mind. They cannot be infiltrated by background knowledge or expectations of the agent. And uh, the last, uh, but certainly not the least important one, a fixed neural architecture. It is often possible to identify determinate regions of the brain associ associated with particular, particular modules. And uh, 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 like I said, uh, there is a problem with uh, such description of uh, high-level cognitive abilities. Because uh, if we think about such abilities like uh, problem solving, or decision making, reasoning, uh, it seems that uh, they cannot be plausibly characterized as producing uh, for example, quick solutions in highly determinate circumstances, being outside executive control, or being unaffected by the activity of other parts of the brain. And uh, uh, there are even uh, more problems with uh, the, mo the most general uh, explanation of uh, mind or behavior, default psychological explanation, because this kind of explanation usually treats mind as a whole, so um, it doesn't divide it into uh, modules uh, or, or even higher cognitive abilities. And uh, the, uh, most, uh, uh, the most common uh, theory uh, of how we uh, uh, explain behavior uh, without the aid of science uh, is, uh, is a so-called theory theory and it proposes that uh, agents possess a theory of behavior which is represented in the brain uh, and this theory is supposed to be largely implicit and consists in broad generalizations which indicate how propositional attitudes such as belief or emotion can, can uh, cause other propositional attitudes and how those, proposi those propositional attitudes cause behavior. So uh, basically it boils down to the fact that each uh, one of us uh, possess such uh, uh, implicit knowledge and uh, when we try to explain uh, the, be the behavior of others we utilize those uh, very crude generalizations to explain this, uh, this behavior. And uh, there, there is a certain picture of the mind present in, in philosophy of mind. It is, uh, it is defended by, by uh, not many philosophers, but uh, unfortunately they, they are usually very distinguished. And one cannot uh, ignore their, their arguments. They say that there is a radical discontinuity between a folk psychological explanation and uh, the explanation of the lower, lower levels. So, for ex so basically, uh, scientific explanations of the mind or behavior. Here is uh, uh, a, a citation from John McDowell. The concepts of pro uh, the propositional aptitudes have their proper home in explanations of a special sort. 
explanation in which explanations in which things are made intelligible by being revealed to be or to be approximate to being as they rationally ought to be. This is to be contrasted with a style of explanation in which one makes things intelligible by representing their common into being as a particular instance of how things generally tend to happen. So this last explanation uh, concerns, of course, scientific explanation. And a uh, second quote from Donald Davidson, which perhaps um, was the first philosopher to underline this uh, discontinuity. Uh, he uh, said that any effort at increasing the accuracy of, and power of a theory of behavior forces us to bring more and more of the whole system of the agent's beliefs and motives directly uh, into account. But in inferring these systems from the evidence, we necessarily impose conditions of coherence, rationality, and consistency. These conditions have now echoed in physical theory. So uh, this is uh, the uh, discontinuity this that I mentioned. Uh, it says that there is a discontinuity between folk psychological explanation and neuroscientific explanation of behavior or specific cognitive abilities. And what is uh, interesting is that it can be understood in two different, at least in two uh, different ways. First, we can uh, say that there is a weak version of this thesis. It says that uh, folk psychological explanation concerns higher cognitive functions which cannot be plausibly described as being realized by simple cognitive modules. It is therefore not possible, at least at the present moment, to propose neuroscientific explanation of these functions. So basically, this, uh, this version of uh, the discontinuity th thesis boils down to the fact that uh, the mm, neuroscientific explanation of behavior is too difficult at the present moment. Uh, but there are no... Uh, uh, there are no uh, more general, more general uh, problems, problems in principle, which would uh, uh, disallow for such, a, for such an explanation. And then we have a strong version of this thesis. Uh, it says that at the highest level of explanation, there exist inherent constraints of rationality and normativity. This kind of explanation is therefore a qualitatively different from the explanation at the lower, lower levels, e.g. at the level of neuroscientific explanation, because there are no equivalent constraints at those levels of explanation. And uh, uh, this uh, thesis will be important uh, later on when I'll uh, say a little bit more about uh, the problem of emotions. Uh, in uh, neuroscientific uh, context. And uh, there are, like I already mentioned at the very beginning, uh, two, uh, two basic uh, diff uh, different uh, and to a large extent uh, and two different theories of emotions. Uh, first one is non-cognitive non -cognitive, non -cognitive theory of emotions, which identify emotions with feelings. And this basic uh, non cognitive theory, non cognitive theory can be uh, uh, can be divided into two versions. First, of, uh, first version uh, says that uh, reductive theories uh, identify emotions with a class of feelings that can be characterized without reference to emotion. And uh, the second version of uh, these theories, non reductive theories propose that feelings associated with emotions cannot be characterized without the reference to those feelings. I think that it will be uh, more understandable when I, uh, when I speak a bit about an example of uh, a non-cognitive theory. Basically, it's the first uh, non-cognitive theory uh, which was proposed in, uh, in uh, psychology. Uh, in 1884 uh, by William James and 1885, if I remember correctly, by Karl Lange. Uh, 
the interesting thing is that they discovered it uh, in, uh, without uh, knowing uh, the other, uh, the experiments of the other. Uh, so the, they discovered separately, uh, and uh, mm, it's, uh, this theory is interesting because it's uh, mm, very. Mm, it contradicts the folk psychological uh, level of explanation of emotion, because uh, the folk psychological level of explanation basically says that uh, first uh, of all we find ourselves in a uh, emotion eliciting situation. Uh, then uh, there's uh, the feeling. Uh, there's the uh, feeling, and then this feeling causes the reaction to this uh, emotion eliciting situation. But uh, William James and Karl Lange uh, uh, argued that this uh, sequence of events is incorrect. They argued uh, that first we find ourselves in a um, emotion eliciting situation and uh, then there is a reaction of the body automa automatic mechanical reaction of the body and, uh, and then uh, uh, after the reaction of the body there is the perception of this reaction which is a feeling so here uh, the emotion, the feeling is, uh, is not understood as the cause of our action but, but it is um, caused it is caused by the action. So, uh, as uh, Professor uh, Krag already mentioned at the very beginning, this theory uh, basically reduces feelings, uh, emotions, to epiphenomena. And uh, uh, it's very interesting uh, in contradiction to the, uh, in comparison to the folk psychological explanation of emotion. And basically, uh, uh, I, I think uh, this uh, theory was adapted in neuroscience. Of course, uh, it wasn't adapted straightforwardly. There were so, there were some modifications. But, uh, um, for example, Antonio Damasio or Joseph Ladu they propose a very similar account of uh, emotion as uh, William James or Karl Lange. Uh, but there is a difference. There are some differences. The most important difference uh, between uh, these, those neuroscientific accounts is that uh, according to the somatic theory, so this neuroscientific theory, emotions can be unconscious perceptions of the patterns of bodily cha changes. So feeling is not a necessary complement of emotion because we can have emotions without conscious experience or feeling. So this is even more in contradiction the default psychological explanation of emotion. And uh, uh, these neuroscientific theories, despite the fact that uh, they, they are uh, um, uh, uh, well, at odds uh, with uh, folk psychological explanation of emotion, uh, they have a couple of interesting uh, characteristics. Uh, first of all, uh, usually uh, uh, they are uh, they, uh, they are comprehensive accounts, which means that uh, they explain emotions at different horizontal levels. So, at the level of the body reactions, the level of neuronal activity in the brain, or the level of conscious or unconscious percep perceptions of bodily reactions. Uh, secondly, uh, they offer vertical explanation of emotion which combines the horizontal explanations. Uh, the vertical explanation of emotion basically boils down to the fact that emotions are perceptions of bodily changes, so they are epiphenomenal. And uh, uh, what is especially interesting, they offer a compelling empirical evidence that supports their conclusions. Uh, for example, uh, seeing a snake can trigger fear response before any judgments have time to form because fear can be triggered by neural pathways from the optic nerve to the amygdala, so the part of the brain which is responsible for, for produ producing emotions. Uh, by passing the neocortex, which is usually described as being responsible for forming the judgment. This is uh, from Joseph Ladeau. 
and uh, uh, this uh, is uh, this will be important when we will uh, uh, discuss the other kind of uh, theories of emotion. And there's, uh, of course, a similarity with Mars' account of vision. So these simple emotions, uh, which are analyzed by neuroscience, are very similar to uh, those cognitive modules, which are um, informa informationally encapsulated, and so on and so on. Uh, so it seems that there are no uh, difficulties in principle to explain emotions uh, uh, like, like this. And then uh, the second kind of uh, theories of emotions are cognitive theories and uh, they underline that emotions, especially moral emotions, possess content, which means that they are about something, uh, uh, in other words, they are intentional. Uh, such moral emotions are as anger, guilt, or shame are not only feelings, but also judgments about states of affairs. It follows that emotions are just a distinct kind of mental state, to be a specific, a distinct kind of a proposition or attitude, and can be at least partially explained by a folk psychological level. So, uh, even of, at this point, we see that there is. Uh, there are, uh, there, are big, there are big differences between uh, cognitive and non-cognitive theories because uh, non-cognitive theories do not mention judgment. Uh, they uh, do not mention judgment as an uh, important part of the emotion itself. And uh, uh, well, cognitive theories of emotions are quite similar to the explanation of emotion to folk psychology. Cognitivists stress that the main component of emotion, which should be present in their explanation, is their content. But it does not mean that perceptions of bodily changes are unimportant. Uh, however, a plausible account of emotions should uh, take into consideration the fact that thoughts about the object of emotion, uh, emotion are integral parts of the emotion itself. And here is uh, the se sequence uh, of events in uh, uh, emo emotional behavior, uh, <coughs> everything that's uh, emotion itself. First, we find ourselves in emo a emotional in a situation, then uh, a judgment of the situation is formed, then we have the feeling, and then we have the reaction of the body. So it's quite similar to the uh, uh, intuitive folk psychological explanation of emotional behavior. And uh, there is an uh, important uh, thing to notice uh, in uh, relation to the judgments, which are parts of the emotion, according to cognitive theories. Uh, because those judgments uh, are usually un understood as uh, uh, able to be correct or incorrect uh, because they can contain two kinds of mistakes. First of all, the ev evaluated state of affairs could be misrepresented by the agent. Uh, so, for example, it is not the case that the person I am angry at committed the, the act. Uh, and uh, second of all, uh, despite the evaluated state of affairs being represented correctly, the appraisal itself can be judged as being incorrect. Uh, for example, according to a rule that one should not be angry at another person if the uh, committed act was insignificant. So uh, this binds us with uh, certain norms of rationality, uh, correctness, uh, and so on, uh, which are present at the uh, folk psychological level of explanation. And uh, this is uh, in line with, uh, with uh, what was uh, mentioned about Davidson and McDowell, that they said that there is this radical discontinuity between folk psychological explanation and neuroscientific explanation. Why? Because uh, these uh, the emotions contain those judgments, which can be evaluated as being correct or incorrect and so on. Uh, and uh, what is more, uh, 
psychologists who usually support cognitive theories of emotions propose that those judgments uh, can be quite complex. Those judgments uh, inherit, inherit in uh, emotions. For example, psychologist Klaus Scherr proposes that there are five categories of those judgments. Whether the stimulus is novel, whether it is pleasant, relevant to our goals, and so on. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, probably one of the most famous experiments in uh, psychology, which demonstrates uh, why emotions are, uh, which explains that emotions have this cognitive content, but uh, uh, I guess I do not have time to present it. Uh, so uh, let's move to the last part of my talk. And uh, the last uh, part uh, concerns the question whether emotions uh, are natural kinds. Because uh, well, what I've said before uh, suggests that there's a certain uh, discontinuity bet between uh, different kinds of emotions. We can have some simple emotions which can be uh, explained uh, by neuroscience. Uh, and we, have, uh, we can have also some very complex uh, more complex emotions uh, which uh, well, uh, seem to uh, produce some difficulties from the neuroscientific explanation and uh, uh, this uh, topic was uh, especially discussed by uh, Paul Griffiths uh, and uh, first of all he defines uh, natural kinds what are na natural kinds and uh, he says that uh, I use the term natural kind to denote categories which admit of reliable extrapolation from samples of the category to the category as a whole. In other words, natural kinds are categories about which we can make inductive scientific discoveries. And uh, so it is obvious that uh, these uh, natural kinds, uh, at least according to Griffiths, are indispensable for scientific explanation because uh, well, they allow to project the observable correlations uh, between the properties of the investigated objects to other objects which belong to the same natural, uh, same natural kind. And uh, well, Griffiths uh, says that emotion can be divided into at least three subcategories. First uh, of all, we have affect program programs, which are these basic emotions. Uh, these uh, uh, most basic emotions studied by neuroscience, for example, uh, with great success. Then we have higher cognitive functions, which do not allow for, for a full uh, neuroscientific explanation. We have to uh, explain it with, with the help of other sciences. And then we have even socially constructed emotions, which are, uh, as Griffiths argues, something which is uh, characteristic only for uh, Homo sapiens. And here are some characteristics of these uh, three subcategories of emotion. Affect programs are basically uh, uh, the before mentioned uh, cognitive modules. Uh, then we have higher cognitive emotions, uh, which are not modular, non-modular, and uh, then socially constructed emotions, which also are non-modular. And some conclusions. Uh, if Griffiths is, is right, then uh, it would be a mistake to project uh, the observable properties of emotions belonging to one subcategory to emotions uh, belonging to the other subcategory, which is uh, quite obvious. Uh, the second conclusion would be that it is not possible uh, to formulate a general theory of emotions, which would include all kinds of emotions. It seems that the non cognitive theory is more adequate to explain affect programs, and uh, cognitive theory is more adequate to, adequate to uh, explain higher cognitive emotions and socially constructed emotions. And uh, also, uh, what is interesting, it seems that there's a philosophical, philosophical assumption made, in, uh, made by uh, those two theories of emotions, namely that emotions form a natural kind. 
and uh, well, the, um, the uh, previous argumentations argumentation supports the thesis that uh, it is this assumption is mistaken. And uh, also, uh, like I mentioned, some emotions affect problems can be explained reductively, and uh, the explanation of other more complex emotions encounters the problem of the discontinuity of uh, explanation. Thank you, and I am very, very sorry for uh, such a long talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very long, it's just some time. Oh. So now if there's if there are questions. Oh, ten minutes to ask a few questions at least. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask uh, about the judgment uh, of uh, emotions or uh, award uh, moral emotions. Uh, uh, how do you think? Can we judge uh, somebody uh, if uh, someone uh, disturb him, uh, even uh, uh, unco um, unconscious, uh, when he was unconscious and the other person is angry? Uh, can we judge um, that it, it was uh, it was it is it is wrong? Or um, I, I I heard that um, we can say. Uh, um, um, at all, at all uh, of uh, moral uh, emotions, that because uh, um, uh, because uh, uh, emotions uh, can be uh, judged. Uh, judged. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Yes, that's a very uh, important question concerning uh, moral emotions. Uh, well, basically, uh, the line of thought uh, which uh, says that uh, emotions are important for morality goes back to David Hume. Hume proposed that uh, there is a there is a well a very basic relation between uh, what we feel about a certain situation and how we judge a certain situation. Judge in terms of it being good or bad. Uh, Hume said that uh, uh, when uh, I, uh, I uh, approve of a certain situation, I, ha I have some positive emotions toward this uh, situation. And he said that, uh, uh, and uh, of course, if I disapprove, uh, I uh, feel uh, it means that uh, this is wrong. I, I judge it being wrong. And uh, this is uh, important because uh, if one uh, uh, is of an opinion that uh, there are no objective values but uh, morality is subjective, this is a very intuitive uh, line of thought to uh, justify morality. That the emotions uh, motivate us and uh, possess this judgment, this uh, content which uh, well, uh, allows to judge the emotions themselves are, uh, are as reasonable or as unreasonable. But of course, if, if one uh, is, is of an opinion that, uh, that moral values uh, exist objecti objectively, uh, well, uh, then I agree that uh, moral emotions are uh, a kind of uh, oxymoron. Okay. Uh, uh, back to the human uh, we can misunderstood uh, some, something and then once I, I, will, I will be sad and when somebody explain me I will be uh, uh, happy so it's, it's yes. too short too short uh, explanation yes because uh, you, and not, uh, uh -huh. yes because uh, like I mentioned emotions uh, consist not only of the feeling which is, uh, of course, uh, not, cannot be judged as rational or irrational, but they also express uh, the judgment. For example, when I'm angry at somebody, uh, mm, it doesn't suffice to say that uh, I feel uh, something towards a person, but it, um, this, the explanation of this emotion has also to possess uh, the, uh, this, uh, uh, this, 
the relation to this content, to this thought, that I think, for example, that this person did something wrong, that he did it and not somebody else, and so on and so on. So uh, w when emotions are, are very complex, when they possess the judgments, they can be uh, uh, understood as rash rash rational or, or irrational. Psychological explanation and uh, your scientific explanation, and you gave you shot two theses to um, explain the discontinuity. Uh, it was a weak one and a strong one, and what if there's a, an even stronger one, which is as simple as folk psychology is wrong? If it's wrong, then there's not. It's not a surprise that we cannot uh, find uh, a neural explanation of it. Like if there was a, a folk physics, mm -hmm. then if scientists started to, to try to explain folk physics in terms of the real scientific physics, they could they wouldn't do it. It would be impossible, and there would be a, a discontinu discontinuity. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. yes, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I agree that. Uh, uh, the, the hidden assumption of my, my argumentation is that folk psychology is important in some extent. That it is, uh, well, even indispensable. But uh, uh, like you said, there were some uh, philosophers, uh, also distinguished ones, who argued that folk psychology is simply mistaken. That we cannot treat it as a uh, uh, scientific theory uh, and um, we shouldn't try to explain things uh, using that, uh, uh, using such concepts as belief, desire, or emotion. But it seems to me that uh, the explanation of behavior or of the mind has to start at uh, the very general level, uh, at the most general level uh, which is available to us. And uh, well, a natural can candidate for such uh, a level would be a folk psychological level. Also. Uh, even uh, the uh, elimin eliminativists, uh, so the, the, the philosophers who try to eliminate folk psychology, right now, uh, well, changed their mind a bit. They said that, uh, for example, Paul Church, and he argues that uh, it is true that folk psychology uh, gives us uh, some generalizations, some uh, some. Uh, uh, laws that should explain behavior, and they, they are true, true to some extent. So they have some positive, some some value. They are of some value. Uh, but uh, of course, to, to a great extent, also this th theory is, is mistaken. So, and he argues that uh, an inter interdisciplinary approach is needed. So when neuroscience informs for psychology, and uh, on the other hand, for psychology informs. Neuroscience. So I don't think that uh, right now, but of course I can be mistaken, there are uh, 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 people who, who say that uh, well, folk psychology is simply something to be uh, rid of, get rid of. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if there are no, question, no further questions, uh, let us thank again Dr. Cool for the stock.